Um, I'd like to welcome Neil. Thank you, Neil, for joining us. Um, Neil is uh, from Kosatu. Um, he's been invited here today, obviously, because Kosatu has seems to have, or Kasatu has taken the position in support of nationalization. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and what Neil is going to be talking about is uh, strategic state ownership as part of a broader package of economic transformation. So we've been talking about economic transformation earlier on. Um, so yes, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I think uh, you can see why Duma is a valued member of the Kasata panel of progressive economists. Um, but I think uh, I've come at the end of a debate uh, where I, I think a lot of valuable input has, has been made. I don't want to zone in on the technical questions around nationalization so much as look at the broader um, strategic debate around the question of transformation of the economy, state ownership, the levers that are available to the state, and within that, the debate about nationalization. You know, some people might say that this debate is now academic, it's come too late, because the decision was taken at the Mangong 2012 con uh, conference of the ANC. The 2010 National General Council of the ANC settled the debate in a particular way. You had the, the SIM study, the ANC study on, on the mining industry, and that in a sense this question of nationalization has been put to bed. But in reality what's happened with the debate is it's been deferred. And I think it's, it's, it's very timely and correct that you're now focusing attention on a debate which has become a bit of a holy cow in South Africa, which people are really too afraid to address this N-word. Um, and we need to, as Duma was saying, we need to address the issues really on their merits. But what I'm going to look at is the context within which the debate is taking place, which actually make it impossible to have a technical or evidence-based discussion uh, on this issue at this particular point in time. So unlike Duma, I'm going to argue that this is not an economic debate first and foremost. That it's first and foremost a political debate and it's about our power in society. And that uh, the technical economic issues can only be addressed once the question of power relations are, are, are addressed. And the debate about economic alternatives in South Africa, uh, I would argue, is bedeviled by, by various things. Firstly, Hajun Chang, an economist uh, who has written on industrial policy extensively, um, said in an interview with, with the New Agenda, Ben Turok, that South Africa is paralyzed by caution. We are paralyzed by caution because uh, we've been afraid since 1994 to do anything that would, would rattle the markets. Um, and that we've lacked the strategies and the political will to utilize the space that's available to us. And I think if we look beyond the financial crisis, where the entire uh, uh, neoliberal economic consensus has, has collapsed, um, and the fact that nationalizations have taken place of various financial institutions, that we have this upsurge of the left in Latin America, that we have a whole series of alternatives which are in front of us. It's quite pathetic, actually, that our movement and our society has be been unable to begin to engage on the real discussions which need to take place. So, but this is partly a result of lack of clear leadership on these matters, what we could call a subjective failure. But it's also partly around the changing class composition uh, in society and in the ruling party and the state, what you could say are objective conditions giving rise to this. And I'll come back to this point. The concentration of economic power in our society is, I would argue, compounded by the capture of key elements of the state and the ruling party by strands of monopoly capital. For example, if you look at Treasury, it's, it's purely and simply a hostage of finance capital. Not actually a hostage to finance capital, is the active uh, embodiment of the interests of finance capital and actively organizes itself to articulate the interests of finance capital in the state. Uh, so you've got th that role of monopoly capital and then you've got the role of the, of the BE empowered elite 
and you've got the comprador, the predatory elite. Uh, you remember Zwilin Zimavavi's thing about the hyenas and the predatory elite. Uh, those who are trying to use through corrupt means their access to the state to accumulate illegitimately. Both BEE and their predatory elite in their own way articulate different forms of corruption because the BEE is an agreement to act as an affront for uh, the uh, monopoly interest in society and to say in, in exchange for this we will acquiesce to that. This is uh, obviously an extreme statement on my part that my friend Duma might uh, uh, disagree with. And then, of course, the other thing which prevents a meaningful debate are the current divisions in, amongst the working class in trade unions uh, and in uh, their left formations in society, uh, which pre prevent workers and uh, progressive forces in society from force forcefully articulating a progressive alternative. So the notion that the nationalization debate is in any way evidence-based is a complete distortion of reality. It's not possible for it to be evidence-based at this point in the context of those factors that I was outlining. There has never been a serious debate in South Africa about the option of nationalization in, in our country. Apart from the re uh, resolutions adopted in, for example, Kasatu Congresses, where delegates have engaged on these issues, uh, but at a national level, we haven't really had the debate. The closest thing to a real debate was in 2010 when the ANC Youth League tabled the proposal for nationalization of mines on the agenda of the National General Council uh, of, of, of the ANC. The problem, of course, was that this wasn't taken seriously more broadly in the country because it was fatally compromised by the fact that it was seen as a proxy for competing interests in the ANC and, an, and emerging class forces uh, wanting to get it, their hands on the state, on state institutions as a vehicle for accumulation. And I'll come back to this point. However, it's been too easy, particularly for conservative forces in the movement, in society and the state, to dismiss the debate that the ANC Youth League raised purely on the basis of their dubious uh, agenda and, and their du dubious origins. In other words, an issue around bona the bona fides of those propagating nationalization in the, in the ANC Youth League. It was a very necessary debate, but as Duma suggested, it was mishandled. So we need to bear a couple of things in mind. Firstly, that the call for nationalization in South Africa has deep historical roots uh, in the liberation movement, um, but it also reflects a, um, a material reality in the history of South Africa, that we've had a very strong state sector which was which is mobilized for particular uh, objectives as well as the international experience. Secondly, there is broad support in South Africa uh, amongst the population for nationalization. Uh, for example, if you look at the survey that was done of Kasatu shop stewards um, last year, I think it was, or 2012, 65% of them supported uh, the need for nationalization. It was around 67% in 1991. So it's a fairly consistent sort of number of the membership of, of, of Kasata, and one would imagine that would represent some broader uh, support in society for, for, for nationalization. Interestingly, though, I'd, I'd wanted to show you the, the table. Uh, ev an even more significant, a much greater number of the shop stewards supported the need for regulation for the need for regulation of the economy and the private sector, not necessarily as an alternative to nationalization, but together with nationalization. And this will come back to the essential issue that I want to raise and which relates to what Duma was saying, which is that we have a whole toolbox of levers that the state can use. Nationalization is one amongst many. Different forms of economic regulation can be extremely powerful in achieving the economic transformation goals that, we, that we're setting. So therefore, this idea of a one-trick pony of nationalization, and even a narrow nationalization agenda of nationalizing the mines, has done a disservice to the debate. So I think it's important to place the nationalization debate in the context of a broader uh, debate around economic transformation. I read the ANC Youth League document again. I, I had read it in 2010, but I read it on the plane coming down from Cape Town yesterday. And it's actually a very good document. 
It's a very good document and I would encourage people to read it. It's a serious analysis of the mining industry. You know, people like Duma and others had made an input. And I think to a certain extent, uh, it's an attempt to deal with the huge opposition that they ran into in the ANC. But it's also a reflection of the fact that the left in the movement jumped on the ANC Youth League sort of bus and put their quite valuable input into the debate. And you see that with the EFF now. A very opportunistic element in the, in the EFF, but on the other hand, a genuine left current, which is attempting to push real transformation. So it's difficult to separate the one uh, from the other. So following a long period of suppression of meaningful debates about economic alternatives, and I'm not talking here just about nationalization. I'm talking about suppression of meaningful debates around the issues that Duma was talking about, around monetary policy, around the Reserve Bank, around taxation policy, a whole host of issues which we've been battling uh, with government and the ANC since the early 1990s. Um, what we have seen in the last few years, and however critical we are of the post-Polokwani moment, the post-Polokwani period, what it has done is it's opened up the space for economic debate like has never been possible before. Uh, so there has been an opening up of a debate around economic alternatives. And there's now the, the re-emergence, particularly after the 2010 ANC NGC that I mentioned, of discussion about the role of the state in the economy. And we can see this, um, for example, the debate by the ANC in 2012 around the need for bold state intervention. And I'll read very briefly the resolution from the policy conference in Mangaung on that. And the call for this more radical second phase centered around economic transformation. And what, very briefly, uh, Mangaung called for was bold forms of state intervention, which is a nice phrase. Bold forms of state intervention, including through one, financial regulation and control, including a state-owned bank. Two, progressive and redistributive taxation. Three, wage and income policies that promote decent work, growth, and address poverty and inequality. Four, progressive competition policies pr that promote growth and employment and address poverty and inequality. Five, a well-resourced state-led industrial and trade policy. And then finally, increased state, state, owner, increased state ownership in strategic sectors where deemed appropriate on the balance of evidence and the more effective use of state-owned enterprises. Now, we can have a lot of debate about the formulations there. And, and as someone who participated in the debates, you know, I've got quite a lot to say about how we arrived at those formulations. And there was considerable watering down of earlier. But the package of bold state intervention, while it's not comprehensive, lays the basis for an engagement around what would constitute the types of economic alternatives which would need to give effect to those, to, 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 to those things. Um, but the cynics point out, with some justification, that these formulations are an attempt to contain and pacify the pressure which has come from the ground and within the alliance for meaningful transformation, including the debate around nationalization. They point, quite correctly, to the contradiction between these apparently more radical economic postures mm -hmm. and the conservative, neoliberal, let's be honest, economics of the, National Democrat, uh, of the National Development Plan. At the same time, the debate is far from closed. And I think that's where I would differ, for example, from some of my comrades in NUMSA, where I think in, in uh, trying to prove a point, we shouldn't go too far to, indicate, to suggest that the space for economic contestation and engagement has been completely closed off. I think the space is still, is still there. Um, and I've seen that from the debates that we've, that we've been involved in. I think the manifesto, again, the NC manifesto, reflects that. Although it also reflects the fact that uh, very, po very progressive formulations that we had in a previous draft of the manifesto on the financial sector were then rolled back at the last minute through the intervention of financial sector interests. So it comes back to the same point, that we're battling against very powerful uh, economic interests within the state uh, and, and the movement. But that doesn't therefore mean that we give up uh, the process of contestation. This is all taking place in the context of changing international realities, including firstly measures to nationalize in, uh, aspects of the financial sector in the north. But of course, this is the worst example 
of nationalization. Uh, as Stiglitz has said, this represented the bailing out of these corporations and the socialization of the debt of these corporations uh, and the privatization of their, of their profits. But on the other end, we've had a real radical alternative being advanced in Latin America, and I understand that Ronnie uh, said, said something about this. In Latin American countries, uh, from fairly center-left states such as Brazil to left states such as Venezuela, who have all moved to use state control and intervention in the economy, as well as ownership and, and nationalization, to effectively assert an alternative development path. And what's very interesting, if you look at Latin America, and we've looked at the Latin exper American experience in depth, um, is precisely what Duma was saying, is the fact that they've used a range of um, levers in quite a pragmatic way, very often, to, uh, to, um, to affect a very uh, radical transformation in society. If you use, you know, what are the most important um, indicators? The most important indicators, really, uh, are the quality, the quality of life of people, employment, reduction in inequality, reduction in poverty, etc. And in that regard, Latin American countries, uh, left countries, while they are not socialist, you know, Venezuela had the most booming stock exchange in, in the world last year, apparently. While they're not socialist, they have strong anti-capitalist uh, measures and strong progressive uh, forms of economic regulation, which have, in the space of a decade, uh, um, massively changed the lives of people. Now, in that, you have different models, and some of the models are more top-down, uh, like in Brazil to a certain extent, and some of them are more bottom-up, bottom as in the case of Venezuela and, 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 and uh, Bol Bolivia. Venezuela, by the way, is very misunderstood on that issue where it's seen to have been simply driven by this cult of the personality around, around Chavez without really understanding what was happening in, in society in terms of this mass mobilization of people, both economically and politically. However, we appear to have, serious, to, to have seriously, uh, to, we, we appear in South Africa to have completely failed to seriously consider these and other international economic alternatives. And our treasury, uh, in particular, um, um, continues as if the Latin American miracle has never happened. And, and it is a miracle what they've managed to achieve in a space of a decade in a hostile global environment. And that neoliberal orthodoxy, um, the con treasury continues to act as, ne as if neoliberal orthodoxy remains untouched. Very, easy, very interesting to follow the IMF's work over the last few years where they have now challenged inflation targeting they ex have accepted the validity of capital controls their latest uh, paper uh, has now said that inequality poses a major threat to economic growth so one by one all the pillars of the neoliberal orthodoxy is coming down but our treasury still adheres to it and it's reflected in our national development plan so there is merit in the approach which was taken by the 2013 Alliance Summit um, to go beyond narrow debates around nationalization of the mining sector to now look at a broader approach of advancing a progressive program of control over the economy both by the state and the social sector or you know the so-called solidarity economy. In this conception nationalization and state ownership is only one lever amongst many. But on the other extreme, conservatives in the ANC in particular have used the generic catch-all phrase, which I'm sure you've all heard, of we will examine things on the balance of evidence. The balance of evidence will tell us whether we should nationalize or privatize. And this, I argue, is a, an excuse for doing nothing. It's another version of the paralyzed by caution. Because I've been involved in all the internal debates in the ANC and the Alliance over the last 15 to 20 years. And I can tell you there has never been a serious analysis of the balance of evidence of doing anything, you know. <laughs>